I have an incredible guest joining us, Carrie Tushoff. She is a certified hypnotherapist, the founder and director of Hypno Babies, and an instructor and trainer. And with a passion for empowering women and promoting holistic, natural birth experiences, she created the groundbreaking Hypno Babies Hypno Birthing Childbirth Program. But that's not all. Our guest has also developed a range of hypnosis tracks and courses addressing various issues from weight release and eliminating nausea to overcoming fears and improving sleep. As a sought after speaker and instructor, she's dedicated to helping individuals tap into the power of their minds for positive transformations. So whether you are soon to be parent seeking a more serene childbirth or someone looking to overcome specific challenges through hypnosis, you're in for a treat. So join me today in welcoming the visionary behind Hypno Babies, our guest today, the one and only Kerry Tushoff. Kerry, welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. It's truly an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Peter. It's just a joy to be here. I'm really honored to, to have you on the show. And can you take us back to the inception of Hypno Babies and share what drew you to focus on childbirth? What ignited the passion that led you to the creation of this groundbreaking program? When I was freshly married many years ago, I was just minding my own business. I was a sales assistant at a stock brokerage firm, and a friend of ours gave birth to her first child, and she did it without drugs. And she did it with a natural childbirth program that I had never heard of. And I didn't even know that people did that. I thought everyone went in and got their epidural and that was it. But she did it. She said, yes, it was very painful, but she wanted to have a natural birth, an unmedicated birth. Let me just start by saying those were her words, because to me, all births are natural. A baby comes out of a body and that is a natural process, however it comes out. But in her case, it was unmedicated. And so I became absolutely fascinated and I became, I went and looked up the program uh, that she had used and I was like, I have to do this. I, I want to teach this. I want to be a part of it. So I convinced the people that ran the program that I could become an instructor, even though I'd never had a baby and they let me. And so I took their training and I started teaching that method of natural birth. And I got such a great education in everything natural, how to live a natural pregnancy so that you could have an unmedicated birthing and just so many things. And so I would teach students in groups and then I would go to their births as a doula, which is a labor assistant. And their births were very painful. But I thought this is doable because about 50% of them went unmedicated and they seemed to be happy. So then when it was my turn to get pregnant, I had thought that I knew everything that there was to have a baby, to having a baby. And I was just floating along, doing my relaxation and breathing exercises. And then I went into labor and found that, oh no, there were things I didn't know, such as when the baby's head is turned around so that the back of their head is scraping on the nerves in your spine all the way down and out. It's called back labor. That is absolutely excruciating and that there's very little that can be done to help it. And whatever there was, I didn't know what that was. And that's how my baby was positioned. And it was awful. And about 20, I guess about 24 hours into all that, I went to the birth center. It was a freestanding birth center that we had chosen with midwives. And I was just in such pain. And I thought, I'm going to be eight, nine centimeters dilated. And I'm going to have this baby. And I can't wait to get it out. <laughs> We went and they turned me away. They said, you're one centimeter dilated and we can't admit you until you're four. And I was crushed. 
it was so deflating and it was actually traumatic. Like I had this traumatic body experience when they said that of, oh my God, I'm going to be doing this forever. And the fear and what turned into terror. <laughs> but we went to a motel nearby and I had also brought a lot of people with me. My father, my mother, my two sisters and my brother-in-law and my husband. And it, it, let's just start out by saying, don't do that. That's one thing that I learned that even if you love these people and they love you back, you will do nothing but worry about them the entire time that you are in labor. And that's what happened. And it added to my stress and added to my trauma. But anyway, we went back to the birth center hours later and they let me in because I was four centimeters dilated. And then for, I don't even know, maybe the next 16 hours, I was just screaming my head off. And there was just nothing to be done. I didn't have the tools to help the pain. Like my husband was pushing on my back and my sister was going, he didn't know what to do. You'll be okay, relax. And no amount of relaxing or breathing is going to help you in that situation. So when it got to be a full day and a half of me doing all of this, I was just, I just said, that's it. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I was screaming those words to my husband, help me. So they wheelchaired me across the street, screaming to the hospital and admitted me. And I had never been so happy in the world to see anyone as I was that anesthesiologist because I asked for an epidural right away. And he came in with this big, long needle. And I was like, let's do it. And, uh, it was after I got the epidural and it took effect. I was sleeping and crying for about six or seven hours. When I was awake, I was crying because I was traumatized by the amount of pain and that I had no tools with which to get through that kind of pain. And I didn't even know that kind of pain existed other than maybe getting a gunshot wound or something. And the fact that I had lost my unmedicated birth, that also really distressed me. So they pushed and pulled the baby out because I couldn't push because I had an epidural. And although I was really happy to see my princess, I could barely hold her because I was just emotionally and physically drained. And I was traumatized. I had PTSD after that. And I also had pains shooting up and down my spine into my legs and my neck and my jaw for three years from the epidural site, which was something I learned that could happen. But I will say, and this is important for anybody listening, that I gained a very healthy respect for anyone who chooses an epidural because now I completely understand. Before I had thought as a natural childbirth instructor Everybody should just have natural birth, meaning unmedicated birth. At that time, that's what we said. Everybody should have a natural birth. Gaining a very healthy respect for people who choose other things was an important lesson that I learned from this birthing. And it made me a much more balanced childbirth instructor because I understood whether it was an epidural or some people just choose narcotics and things like that to dull the pain, or whether a person chooses outright to plan a scheduled C-section, every birth is unique. The person giving birth has special, unique needs, and we need to honor those. And after that, I was, I could teach my classes, my natural childbirth classes in a much more balanced way. But personally, I didn't even realize what was happening to me. I was off the charts, PTSDing and postpartum depression. And it wasn't until my daughter was two and a half and she was very verbal. And I threw her into her car seat. We were going somewhere and I just couldn't smile like I couldn't. I hadn't been able to smile for a long time. And she said to me, Mommy, be happy. I want to make you happy. Oh, my God, Peter. Just remembering 
the moment when I realized that my precious daughter felt responsible for making me happy because I was so depressed, it changed my life. And I was in therapy the next day. I got antidepressants and then I started hypnotherapy and it helped me so much. And I was able to heal. I was able to start healing. And, and in four years almost to the day that I gave birth to my daughter, I gave birth to my son at a freestanding birth center. His birthing was only seven hours long, which was so wonderful. But again, his head was turned around, so the pain was ferocious. But I only had my husband, my sister, and my midwife there with me. So at least I was calm, not worrying about people or not having extra stress or anything. But it was literally one moment that changed my life forever in that birthing, where I was inside a very gnarly contraction. My husband was pushing on my back. My sister was holding my hands, or rather I was squeezing hers out front here. And I was screaming. And when it was over, I could barely breathe from the screaming. And I looked up into my sister's face and she was sobbing. And she said it should never have to be this hard. And it was like this light bulb went on over my head right there in the middle of labor that even if I never had another child, and I didn't, that I was going to find a way that other people who wanted a more holistic birthing experience didn't have to go through this. So I had my son in a big tub of water. It was actually a healing birth because I was able to have him vaginally without anybody pushing or pulling him out. And after that, I just went on a quest to try to find what was that going to be, that thing that was going to help other women, other people. And so I saw this TV show where this obstetrician, he was a hypnotherapist. And for those of his patients who wanted it, he would teach them hypnosis. And it showed two of them, two couples and their births. And I said, that is it. Hypnosis helped me. I'm going to pursue this. So I did. And I went and got trained at a regular hypnobirthing organization, and that didn't work out for me because it just wasn't what I was looking for. It was very little hypno in the birthing, and I was looking for something, like I learned something big, something that was going to make a huge difference. And so I went and studied hypnosis itself because I hadn't done that. And then I studied hypnotherapy, and then I became a hypnotherapist. And then I started taking training programs, hypnosis training programs for pain management with hypnosis. There was a program called Gerald Kine's Painless Childbirth Program. And I took that training and Jerry Kine, who is no longer with us, he had sat down with women, Peter, and asked them, if you could have a really great birthing with hypnosis, what are some of the things that you would really want to be included? And they said things like, I want my birth partner to learn all this with me and have cues to help me. I want to be able to move around and get into different positions without losing hypnosis focus. And they gave him all these great ideas. And he created this program for women. And after I trained in it, I was fascinated because it filled in all of the blanks. It used what's called hypnoanesthesia. And that's actually a real thing where people who are allergic to medical anesthetics, and this is a rare thing, but it does happen. They have to work, they they have to have a surgery of some kind, but they can't use the medical anesthetics because of the allergies that they have to it. So they work with a hypnotherapist ahead of time and they use special cues so that they can actually get through the surgery. And the surgeon's scalpel will feel like a little bit of tingling or maybe stretching or pulling sensations and the heel easier and faster too with hypnosis. And once I realized that was a real thing and it was in this program, I asked Jerry, 
could I take these techniques, which are normally used one-on-one -on -one with a hypnotherapist and a pregnant person in their office at one session a week for six weeks, could I take these techniques and put them into a complete childbirth education program? And he said, I can't wait to see what you create. And oh my gosh, so I did. And hypnobabies had to be a complete childbirth education program because when I was teaching the other hypno program, hypnobirthing program, my students were coming to me for the hypnosis part of it, which was very light, but they were missing the childbirth education part of it. So they would go to a childbirth class where they are being told childbirth is very painful and you're just going to have to make friends with it or get an epidural. And the philosophies of that, the whole belief system of that was not what I was teaching. That was not what I wanted to teach. So I made Hypnobabies a complete childbirth education program so that we teach nutrition and exercise and staying healthy and low risk and all the stages of birthing and postpartum and regular physical comfort techniques and just everything that you can learn and somnambulistic deep hypnosis cues, which create hypnoanesthesia. And that was 22 years ago. And oh my gosh, it has just been glorious. So that's my story. Dropping down into that somatic terror was meant to be. Because now it, you've not only given birth to two young lives, you've given birth to a whole new approach and a whole new way of being. But I, I don't think without you going through that experience and going into that pain, and I can't imagine, I do understand pain because I've had pancreatic pain and that is really painful. Childbirth? No, as a man. But I, I can only imagine that the pain you went through, but it's giving you a deeper penetration and a better understanding of both sides of things from the natural childbirth, to the medicalized childbirth. And in a way you had to go through that to emerge out of it, almost like from a caterpillar to the butterfly, but that transition, that metamorphosis is messy. So you've arrived at a place now where you can give that education to those who don't necessarily have the tools. And I want to touch on um, the subconscious mind, because I think the power of the subconscious mind is a cornerstone of therapeutic hypnosis. How do our beliefs and internalized thoughts about birth shape our experiences? Can you share an example of how reframing our mindsets about the birthing process can lead to a more positive outcome? Absolutely. We teach our students in hypnobabies to focus on what they want. And one of the reasons why is because they are constantly bombarded by other people's stories or they're reading online birth stories that are scary. And that goes into the conscious mind, but then the subconscious mind is also always listening. So it's creating those belief systems about child. And then because we have those belief systems, then we have body processes that are going on inside, manifesting things that are probably not so good. Stress hormones and chemicals that bathe our bodies and keep it tense and make us unable to sleep and make us unable to even think properly. And so then we make decisions based on those thoughts and belief systems that shouldn't be there in the first place. Whereas if we believed from a conscious level all the way down to a subconscious level, that childbirth, what that pregnancy and childbirth were the most natural things in the world and that we are in charge of how those things roll, how they go, it comforts us. It creates a completely new belief system consciously and subconsciously down here, that belief system then bathes our body in the proper hormones, the ones that get us ready for birthing this baby 
And as we stay more calm, of course, then our body is relaxed. We sleep better. We don't have these fears creeping in all the time. And we are able to make decisions and guide our own selves from the inside out to create a more positive experience. And this is true for anybody anywhere regarding anything. So I tell people, if I could tell you any one thing, it's to keep your thoughts focused on what you want instead of what you don't want or what you fear, okay? Because fear is useless, actually. Uh, it, it serves its purpose when you're in a scary situation like being mugged, but it, that doesn't happen to most of us. But worry and fear actually are damaging to not only the body, the emotions, but your brain. And I'm not going to get into the whole neurology of it, but if you were in an fMRI machine when fear was introduced, all kinds of things are happening that shouldn't happen, that then create other things to happen in the body. Um, and neural connections are made that are not good neural connections, whereas um, they have proven that if when we think positive thoughts, when we say positive words, even the word love or peace, they can see it in the fMRI. All kinds of things in the amygdala are firing off. We are creating neural connections and synapses that create positive effects in the body. And I won't go on about that. But this one thing I want to tell everybody, so focus on what you want. And I use an example. If a person wants to, if you want to, whoever's watching this out there, listening, if you would, your goal is to buy a yellow VW bug, how much time are you going to spend researching, going to dealerships, asking your friends, going online, reading about buying a Tesla? You would spend absolutely zero amount of time doing that because it is not going to get you to your goal. But when you focus on the VW bug, you'll see VW bugs everywhere. You'll see ads for VW bugs. You'll look it up and then all of a sudden you'll start seeing things about VW bugs all over the internet. And then it helps you to achieve your goal. Because you're working towards the goal, you're working towards getting the VW bug and not something that you don't want. And sitting there thinking even, I'll never be able to afford one, that is opposite of what needs to happen. You need to actually tell yourself every day, all the time, I am going to be able to afford it. I see myself in the VW bug with the top down, just flying around happy as a clam. and. Focus on what you want. So that is what we teach our students in Hypno Babies, is to focus on the kind of birthing that you want instead of what you're fearing. Because anyone who sits around and says, I don't want a cesarean, I don't want a cesarean, I don't want a cesarean, I really don't want a cesarean. The inner mind does not process negatives the same way that it processes positives. And it will jump right over that word don't so that the message becomes, I want a cesarean. And that is what you're reinforcing over and over again, plus creating stress hormones. So always think, I want a beautiful, unmedicated, uncomplicated, physiological birth. And I see myself and I feel myself holding my baby afterwards just full of joy. Super important. Yeah, I can attest to that. I remember years ago, I wanted to buy a particular brand of car. And the initial thought was, I can't afford it. That's what I told myself. And then after some development work, I realized that the language I used closed arenas of possibilities. Then I reframed it to, how can I afford it? Oh, that just opened up whole new bunch of arenas of possibilities because then my brain got on the frequency of what strategies, what steps can I take? It started opening up solutions that so became much more solution. -based. 
Exactly. And I think that's a really important point because we tend to focus on the what's wrong mindset, not the what works mindset. And one opens up arenas of possibilities and one closes arenas of possibilities because we know those neurons and the science now supports this is that when you have a narrative, a negative narrative, those neurons will wire together. This is why people say, oh, you can't unsee what you've seen. So it's very important in terms of the narrative that we actually use in our lives, and especially whether it's with birth or whether it's in life or in business, it's a very important point. I'm really glad you highlighted that. Something that's come up in me for, for listeners, because I'd just like to explore the, the concept of therapeutic, I stress therapeutic hypnosis, because some may be unfamiliar with it or hold certain misconceptions. So why should individuals embrace therapeutic hypnosis and how can we dispel any fears or misunderstandings surrounding it? It's very important for people to understand what hypnosis is and what it isn't. For instance, many people out there, if you say the word hypnosis, it conjures up stage hypnosis. They're thinking in their mind, somebody gets plucked from the audience and then sat in a seat and somebody does something to them and they have no control over themselves and then they have to quack like a duck, sing like Elvis or do something other thing embarrassing. And that is not real hypnosis because the person or people who have been chosen want to be part of the entertainment and they're playing a game and they're having a lot of fun. And it is a lot of fun to watch. I have friends who are stage hypnotists. However, what everybody needs to know is that real therapeutic hypnosis is nothing like that. And first of all, hypnosis is a very focused form of concentration that we are all in states of hypnosis all the time, every day. For instance, different times throughout the day, any time that we're reading, if you're reading a book or a tablet or a screen, your laptop, the newspaper, anytime you're reading and your eyes are going back and forth, you enter an alpha state, which is a state of hypnosis where your brain waves are slowing down. And so we're in a state of hypnosis when we're going to sleep and when we're waking up, which is why it is so really wonderful to either give yourself positive affirmations as you're going to sleep or listen to a hypnosis track. And in the morning, you will wake up feeling much more positive. And anytime that we're daydreaming, we might be sitting in a lecture or we might be sitting, just sitting by ourselves, dreaming of Hawaii. We enter an alpha state. We are in a state of hypnosis. Of course, everyone knows this one while we're driving. So you're driving along and you're thinking about what's going to happen when you get to wherever you're going. And all of a sudden you're sitting at a traffic light or you may even be at your destination and you're thinking, how in the world did I get here? I don't remember the last, I don't even know, five minutes. You were in a state of hypnosis. And these things are just what we do. It's how our mind works all the time. So therapeutic hypnosis is where we take the hypnosis deeper than that. So for instance, if we have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind down here, in the middle, we have what's called the critical faculty. And we need to make that guy take a nap because it's a filter and it doesn't let everything into the subconscious. So to make it take a nap and get down to the subconscious directly and just basically retrain it, we use hypnosis. And that means we usually, the process is to relax the body first. And we do that many times with a progressive relaxation from the top of the head all the way down to the toes. And when I say relaxation, some people think that they're going to sit in front of the TV and go click and that's relaxing. <laughs> and Although it might be relaxing, it is not deep relaxation, which is what we need. 
So we relax the body, especially the face muscles, the eye muscles, the neck and the shoulders where we hold a lot of tension. And once those are relaxed and let go and we release them, the rest of the body follows. And then we can relax the mind. And we do that by sometimes counting backwards. As you count backwards, the numbers start disappearing and you just start going into a state of deep mental relaxation where you're not thinking of other things. It could be imagining walking down a set of stairs. And when you get to one platform, then you're at A level. And then you walk down another set and you're at B level. And when you get to C, you are deeply relaxed. And then your mind just is very receptive. And the brain waves slow way down. And we get our students into what's called a theta state where their brain waves are very slow. And it's one step before delta, which is sleep. And so in that state, down in the subconscious, we can basically retrain the subconscious to believe what we want it to believe because it doesn't know the difference between reality and fantasy. When you are down at the subconscious level, It's like a five-year-old where you tell them something and they go, okay, all righty then. So we give it these suggestions. And what I say is that it's basically new software. We're updating, we're giving it new software. And then every day we reinforce it by reinforcing the software and updating the software and updating it. And that just means listening again to that hypnosis track or the one that the no therapist gave you from the session that you were at. In Hypno Baby's case, our students listen to their hypnosis tracks and we have a series of them. So the first week they listen to certain ones and the next week it builds upon that by listening to others and so forth. And we just keep updating that software. And it is amazing how many things can be helped I want to say everything that can be helped with hypnosis, because once we reach that subconscious level and we are giving it new software and then updating the software, we can get rid of fears and phobias and release weight and stop smoking. And oh my gosh, so many things. We we have tracks for eliminating nausea and fear of childbirth and insomnia and uh, fear of needles even. There are so many ways that we can all use therapeutic hypnosis. So that is the way that I basically explain. And I think it's important to realize, as you were saying, you install in a way the software through the tracks and the consistent listening because that builds density and that density then determines your outcome. You've got to build it. And that takes consistency. And I'd just like to distinguish between therapeutic hypnosis and other practices like meditation or visualization. Can you elaborate on the differences and explain why therapeutic hypnosis is unique and a valuable tool, especially in the context of childbirth preparation? Absolutely. Because people do say to me, that's just meditation. In a way, it is meditation, but it's not just meditation. So meditation, for those of us who do it, we understand a little bit deeper, but it is basically just sitting down with ourselves. We sit down or we lay down and we clear our thoughts and we keep clearing our thoughts and we keep clearing our thoughts until We can just rest. And in that state, it might be that we're focusing on our breathing just to calm down. Every day for 15 minutes, calm down. That might be our goal. There might be a mantra, which is a certain word or phrase that means something to that person who is meditating. It could be spiritual. It could be a spiritual meditation. But we're basically just sitting in that state. And it is a relaxed state. And we might enter an alpha state in meditation, and that is fantastic. I think most people do. If they meditate for any longer than about 10 minutes, they're probably in an alpha state. Then hypnosis takes it much deeper. You go farther into the subconscious to a deeper state, 
In hypnobabies, it's called somnambulism, which is a very deep state of hypnosis where hypnoanesthesia can be created. And then we introduce specific concepts. So for instance, that pregnancy and birth are perfectly normal and you are going to feel more confident every single day. And then we move on to the hypnoanesthesia for the certain parts of the body and what that's going to be like during childbirth and when the water breaks and so forth and so on. So those are our specific hypnotic suggestions, which are directives to the subconscious mind. So that's what we're doing in hypnosis. We're doing a lot more than just in meditation. And in visualization or guided imagery, we're in a lighter state of hypnosis and we're guided through a story, basically. Maybe deer walking through the woods or imagining yourself on a beach and things like that in order for us to just relax. And it, it could be that there are visualization goals within the guided imagery. Many times there are. It's just we're not in as deep a state as hypnosis when we get down there and we're retraining for specific things like eliminating a phobia, fear of flying, or whatever it is our goal is. And so uh, it, is hypnosis meditation on steroids? <laughs> yes. Do you need a glass of water? Me? Yeah. No, but could you hold on for a second? I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. Take your time. I know this is unprofessional. We got a foster puppy. And oh, he, no, I get cats on or dogs on all the time. They want to come on. He jumped the gate and he was at the door. Yeah. I had a guest yesterday. She had a cat and a cat wanted to come on the podcast. His, His name? name is Sparky. Sparky. So he has been through a lot. And so he wanted to be in with mama. Oh. So he was at the door, pawing at the door. I always wonder where the dogs have come here, even though they have a short life because their heart beats faster, to teach us loyalty and love. They do. Oh, my gosh. I, I love dogs so much. They just do nothing but give us love. And dogs yeah. like this, where people mistreat them. Oh. It breaks my heart, and I have to be part of helping. I have to be part of the solution. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I can see that in you. So I'm really intrigued by hypnosis. And I remember doing it in an NLP course, and I'm intrigued by how it can help individuals prepare for the unexpected during birth. Do you have any insights on this aspect and how being in a hypnotic state can be a valuable asset in navigating unforeseen circumstances? Absolutely. So stuff happens during childbirth. And in our course in HypnoBabies, we teach people a lot of things like the benefits and the risks, the alternatives of all the common interventions and things that they could come up against in the hospital. And when I say come up against, it's because births are being managed. They're being altered and changed by different procedures and treatments that may not need to be done. And if they are done, they can change the course of the birthing itself. So we teach them all of those things, the benefits, the risks, and the alternatives and how to determine the difference and how to ask the right questions when they're in there having a baby. And also the most important thing about all that is that they are 100% in charge. Mm. Most people don't realize that. They think the doctor said this or the nurse said that. But you still get to say, I understand that you are suggesting this treatment because they can't make you do anything ever. You're in charge. I would like you to tell me what the benefits and the risks and the alternatives are of this treatment and what happens if we don't do anything and what happens if we delay for a while. And once they've answered all your questions, then you can say the words, thank you, if it's not an emergency. You can go out now and we will discuss it and let you know what our decision is. Most people have no idea they can do that. 
And a birthing mother in hypno babies can walk and talk and ask all these questions completely in hypnosis, completely relaxed and calm and with no stress and all of that, because that's built into hypno babies. It's what's called eyes open childbirth hypnosis. And Gerald Kine created it. So it's basically that you can maintain your hypnotic depth, you can maintain your relaxation, you can maintain your physical comfort, you can maintain your emotional confidence no matter what happens and stay deeply in hypnosis and still do whatever you need to do. Walk, talk, move around, go to the bathroom, eat, whatever you need to do. And if things do happen, if unforeseen circumstances come up and you actually do need a change to the plans that you made for your birthing, then we have what's called the change of plans track. Now, most of our hypno baby students do not even ever hear it because everything usually goes smoothly. But for people who, for instance, they didn't want an IV when they were having their baby and not everyone needs one. Very few people actually need an IV, but it's one of those things that they manage you with. They get an IV going in every person if you allow it, just in case we need to do surgery. Oh my goodness. Or push drugs. Say something happened during the birthing and you really do need an IV. Say you're dehydrated. That is a change of plans. And so you listen to the track and in deep hypnosis, it is telling you it's okay. We're just going to flow with this new treatment. We're going to relax. We're going to know that it is for the best. We're going to trust the birth professionals that are working with us. We're going to honor and respect them like they honor and respect us. And we're going to flow right through it. And then they can keep listening to that track over and over again if they want to, or they can come out of it. And then the blood pressure stays normal. The temperature stays normal. The veins stay nice and plump instead of going flat from stress. And yeah, it's really easy to use hypnosis for just about anything that can come up. And we've had people who they've determined that particular birthing person needs a cesarean. And so they'll be listening to this truck all the way into surgery and just calm as a cucumber. And that's what it's all about is really helping yourself throughout everything, throughout your pregnancy, throughout your birthing, throughout your postpartum, throughout new parenthood. Hypnosis can help with all of those things. The greatest gift we're given is the gift of choice. And when you quieten the body down and you bring a peaceful chemistry to the body, it brings peace of mind. But you've got to have peaceful chemistry. What I see you're doing is that with those tracks, it's allowing the body just to oh, and let go and get you out of the way, get the rational brain out of the way. And one of the most intriguing aspects that you've highlighted is the empowerment of expectant parents to create the birthing experience that they desire. Do you have any real world examples or stories that showcase? the transformative impact of therapeutic hypnosis in enabling an individual to shape their unique birthing journey? Is there something that resonates with you most about these experiences? Let's start with the birth partner. So when I was first teaching hypno babies, it was just me teaching it in group classes in my hometown. And so this couple came in to my class, the first class of six, and joined the group. And the mom was having her fourth baby. And she was fine. She was nice and relaxed. And the dad was just so freaked out. He was so nervous. He was pacing the room in the classroom. And he said, I just need something. I just need to know that I'm going to be able to help her because the last three births, they treated her so badly and I didn't have anything I could do to help her. And 
She had the babies unmedicated, but she was in so much pain. And he was a bag of rags. And I went, well, all right. So I went home and I wrote a script for the birth partners and I recorded it and gave it to him and all of my guys, all the dads in the class. And I said, I need you to listen to this three times this week. And they all did. And the following week he came back, he was so different. Every week he was so different. And I ended up going to that birth as their doula. Hmm. He was so wonderful. He was like birth partner extraordinaire. And so from that aspect of it, it showed me that, first of all, the birth partners need to relax and be calm and have these nice hormones running around their bodies as well. And to be calmer for the birthing mother and that we could do that with hypnosis. And another thing is that a first time parents are, they don't know what they don't know, and it's the unexpected. And so they can benefit greatly by being calmer through the pregnancy, looking forward to and anticipating the birthing with a lot of joy rather than trepidation. And so this one young couple, they went through my hypnobabies class and they said, we want you to come as our doula. And then I get a call at about eight o'clock in the morning, one morning, and it was her. And she said, my water broke. And I said, what are you going to do? Because they have choices. And she said, I'm going to hang. I'm going to bake some cookies for the nurses. Because we do teach them that the nurses are the unsung heroes and to bring them a treat. Mm -hmm. And when I need to, I'm going to start listening to my birthing day tracks and just relax. And I went, okay. So she did that. And at about five o'clock, I get a call from the dad, the birth partner. And I said, how's she doing? And I'm thinking she's a first time parent. It might be tomorrow that she gives birth. It might be a full day. He said, she's been listening to her birthing tracks for the last couple of hours. And We're going to leave for the hospital because we think we should. And I said, good. She's listening to her intuition. I said, call me when you get there. So at seven, he calls me and he says, she's at nine centimeters. And I said, I'll be right over. And he turned to her and said, do you want Carrie to come? Because she was fine. And she said, yeah, she can come. Most first time moms, if you've ever been at one of those births, they are panicked. And if there are no drugs on board, holy cow. So I get there and I walk in the room, Peter, and she's just sitting in a chair right next to the door, looking like she's asleep with her head back, her arms on pillows, like that. And she's breathing deeply because she's in the middle of a contraction, which we call birthing waves. Uh, So I look at her, I look at the dad, he smiles. I look across from me and right in front of me is her OB, her doctor, sitting on her bed with his jaw hanging open. And he's just staring at her. Now, I knew this OB because he was a local obstetrician and I already knew him. And when she was finished with the contraction or her birthing wave, She opened her eyes and smiled and looked up at me. And I go, you doing okay? And she goes, great. And the doctor turned to the nurse, who was also standing in the room, and said, how far along did you say she was? How many centimeters? And she said, nine. And he said to me, this hypno stuff must really work. Amazing. I want you to come in and do an in-service for me and my team. And so I did. But That mom went on to have this beautiful birthing not long after that in joy. And really, Peter, that is when I realized what people could do for themselves, that they were giving themselves this amazing gift. And I will say, though, that it's wonderful when it's a first-time parent, but it's equally as wonderful to me if somebody comes in and they've already before 
had some sort of challenging birth, difficult birth, painful birth. They want something different this time with this birthing. And so they do hypno babies and they have their healing birth. Oh my gosh, that gives me goosebumps. Because it makes all the difference in the world to them moving forward. They're going to then have that to pass along to friends, to relatives, telling them about it, to their children. This is how you were born. It's amazing. This is how birth can be instead of what everyone's telling you. That's the ripple effect. The ripple effect means that it doesn't just go in one direction. It goes in many directions. So there's a remedial balm. There's a healing balm to this aspect. And I wonder about advocacy during labor and the presence of birth partners, because I believe they're vital components of a positive birthing experience. Um, Can you speak to the importance of having a supportive birth partner and how they can play a role in advocating for the birthing individual's preferences and being? Yes. The first thing I'd like to say is that Hypno Babies is actually designed so that if you don't have a birth partner or you have one, but they don't want to be involved, which does happen and that's fine. Some people even prefer nobody to touch them or talk to them while they're birthing and they really don't want their partner involved in the process. Hypno Babies can be done completely on your own. So it is designed so that you can listen to all the tracks and read all the materials and learn all the childbirth education and create the kind of birthing that you want by yourself. And if you have a birth partner, we really do give them a lot to do. There's a whole section in Hypno Babies in class number three or five, excuse me, about the birth partner. So they have a what's called a birth partner's guide and it teaches them what they can do during the pregnancy to help the pregnant person stay calm and relaxed, do things for them, even rub their feet and understand that they've got this thing that's the size of a small watermelon happening. They're nurturing it. They're trying to sleep. They're a little bit uncomfortable sometimes and go do the shopping and just a bunch of things that they can do to prepare for the big day. And then on the big day, we train them that These are the techniques that they've been learning, that they've been, the the new software, all these cues and techniques, these post-hypnotic cues that we're going to be using. This is how you use them. There's four pages of what we call birthing prompts that they could literally read from if they wanted to sit next to the birthing mom and read the birth prompts, which are directly from all of the scripts and tracks that the mom has been hearing. So it activates those cues right in real time. So they can do that during the birthing. There's physical cues that they can do. There's a hand on the shoulder or forehead, which deepens their hypnosis immediately. That's a birth partner thing. There's also physical things that they can do to help the birthing person get into different positions squeeze their hips, which really helps to relieve the pain in that area. There's different things that we teach them and they get to go through a hypno baby's birthing rehearsal. So they get to put Mm. all of this stuff together and see how it works and be hands-on and in the end, give birth to a baby doll. (laughs) We teach them how to do all of these things because it's important for the birth partners to feel confident and calm as well and know how to use the cues and techniques and be for the pregnant partner to be very attuned to their birth partner's voice and touch as well. It's all great stuff. And I'm so glad that people are choosing hypno babies so that they can really give themselves this gift of preparing for birth with happiness and joy rather than going, oh my gosh, I'm just going to have to get through it. Number one, it's so comprehensive what you put together. But when I listen to what how you're talking about it, is that it just seems so natural to do it that way. There's that natural attunement between the partners to their feelings, to their touch, 
all those things, which would be very natural in terms of being able to provide that remedial balm to them as they're going through that process, because it's a two-way thing. It's not just, yes, the lady is giving that birth. The man's also importantly pregnant with many considerations as well, and usually dominated by uh, helplessness or fear or whatever it is. So I think the more educated, the more intelligently informed they are, especially men, then the better the experience can be. I think that should be part and parcel of responsibility for a man to be able to take this on board as distinct from, I don't know nothing about birth. It's just a woman saying that kind of mindset that some men have. And I'm glad that with what you're doing, that's now changing. And I want to talk to you about empowerment through language because Traditional childbirth narratives often emphasize pain and medical interventions, as you alluded to, creating fear, creating anxiety, as you experienced, and reframing the language surrounding childbirth can empower expectant parents. Words matter, and using positive, empowering language can shift the mindset towards a more positive and confident birthing experience. So how can reframing the language surrounding childbirth empower expectant parents and contribute to a positive birthing experience? Okay. So I do teach a lot about language to our students, but also to birth professionals. And we use different words in hypnobabies because there are two meanings of words. Words have a denotation, which is a literal meaning, what the word actually means, and then a connotation, which is the emotional meaning, which each person has a relationship, an association with that word. It does come from their experiences with that word. So for instance, and we always want in hypnobabies, we always want the associations to be very positive. So we change the word labor, which the first thing we learn in life about labor is that it's work. Okay. It's we're laboring. So there's an association with the word work. But then for pregnant people, the word labor always conjures up somebody else's or their own in the past birth story that was not so good. And it brings up fear. And as soon as fear comes in, then of course we have those changes in the brain, we have those changes in the body, and we make actually different decisions. So we changed it to birthing or birthing time. And on that note, instead of saying deliver, like the doctor delivered my baby or the delivery or I'm going to deliver at blah, blah, blah. We say you're going to give birth. No one delivers you of your baby. Pizzas are delivered. Babies are born. And when we think about it that way and use those words, there is a lot more empowerment behind it. I am going to give birth. I am not going to be delivered of my baby. Due date. This is the date that everybody has in their mind that their doctor or midwife gave them a long time ago that they are to be expecting their child. And guess what? No. Just plain no. 5% of all babies are born on their due date. From two weeks before that date or two weeks after that date is perfectly normal for a baby to be born. That's an entire month. So we say guest date because automatically it then says to the inner mind and the conscious mind at the same time, we're just guessing when this child is going to come. We're going to be ready whenever that is for that guest date. And for instance, the word transition. This is a period of time during uh, a person's birthing 
where they've gone through the entire active labor. They've been dilating and effacing and they're almost ready to push their baby out. So it's right at the end with those last few centimeters left to dilate and the birthing waves are coming one on top of another every two minutes with maybe a 30 second break and they're long and productive actually. And so, but even though transition is a really great word to describe this period of time where we're transitioning from the dilating phase to the pushing phase, we're transitioning. The word transition for a pregnant person almost always comes with a jolt of fear because of somebody else's saying, when I hit transition, I lost it or I was fine right up until transition, or transition is the shortest time, the shortest uh, phase of birthing, but it's the hardest. That's what you'll read on all these websites and in all these books. Oh my gosh. So there isn't a positive association there with the word transition. So we call it transformation. We're transforming from dilating into pushing. And with this new association, we also attach it to messages within hypnobabies that say that this is the best time of birthing, the most productive time of birthing. You're just about to push your baby out, and it's full of joy. And then they can look forward to it. They can actually look forward to their birthing waves coming every two minutes. Oh my gosh, I'm just about to, have to push my baby out completely different. There's a completely different association. And so we use different words when we use different words, and all of us need to use different words for things. When we use positive language, like I said before, even if you say the word peace, which is actually one of our cues in hypnobabies, but if anyone just says the word peace, that word peace has an emotional connotation, an emotional meaning of calm, joy, getting along, and it'll start firing off things in our brain, which translate into our body, which then create positive behavior. So that's how all that works. Mm, that's beautiful. Some may argue, I'm thinking of people listening to this, some may argue that Positive language may create unrealistic expectations. How do you address the balance between positivity and acknowledging the unpredictable nature of childbirth? We do teach our students a lot in the childbirth portion about things that can happen and about cesareans and certain complications, but there is a fine line. Because you can't have people dwelling on those things. The more they focus on those things, even if they're saying, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, then they're creating it. So we do teach them to be flexible, to understand that childbirth can change right in the moment. It could be something with the baby's position. It could be something with the mother's health. It could be that the mom is just plain tired and she wants something. She wants an epidural or she wants Nubane Stadol or something to help her to relax and, and sleep, <clears throat> excuse me, in between birthing waves. If those things happen, then that's just all part of the plan. It's all part of what their birthing needs to be. And for instance, in our affirmations track, which they listen to every single day, just one lines of positive affirmations about pregnancy and birthing, looking forward to the birth and how well it's going to go. It also says, I am fine with whatever path my birthing journey takes me on. And it's super important that is repeated over and over again. And in the messages within Hypno Babies in our scripts and our tracks, because it's important for them to understand that things might change, that you can set up the most perfect birthing and write the best birthing plan and 
Babies don't know anything about that. Things could change in your body at any time. Things could change with, who knows? We try to encourage our students to only allow people with them during their birthing who are going to be a positive influence on them. And the importance of that, which is they can change your state of mind right in the minute. If you bring your beloved mother, who you absolutely adore, and all she is saying throughout the whole thing is, go, just go get the epidural. I did it. You'll love it. It just, but oh, honey, honey. That can change things. So watch who you invite, watch who you bring, watch the atmosphere in the room, you know, make sure. And we teach the birth partners how to be the hypno guardian. Let's all be positive. If you have something to say that is not, you know, encouraging during this birthing, let's step out into the hallway (laughs) and we'll talk about it. So there's a lot of things, but yes, they have to be flexible. They need to be flexible and they need to be okay with whatever path their birthing journey brings to them. Because of all the variables, it's not an exact science. So you have to be prepared for those variables. And in terms of one of the things that really irks me, and you really highlighted this, is the conventional norms often focus on potential complications and medical procedures during childbirth and reframing the process to highlight positive outcomes, emphasizing the body's natural capabilities fostering a sense of confidence in the birthing individual, as you've alluded to, can contribute to a more joyful and positive experience. How does the emphasis on potential complications and medical procedures during childbirth affect the overall experience for expectant parents? Let me start out by saying that 95% of our students give birth in a hospital with an obstetrician. We would love it if more people would consider having a midwife-assisted birth because they are trained in normal birthing. They're They're trained in everything for a healthy pregnancy and a healthy, normal physiological birth. That means advocating for and helping you to work through a normal birthing without interference unless it's necessary. On the flip side of that, obstetricians are surgeons that are trained in obstetrics and they are trained in everything that could go wrong, and that is their focus. And the philosophies of all of this are completely different. And what happens, and I'll just say this in the U.S., but other countries have followed suit, is that there are procedures that are put into place, and I'm not ragging on the medical community because this is just the way that it is now. It's just the way that it is. There are procedures that are put into place so that the hospitals and doctors make more money, save time, and avoid litigation. And that means that they manage the births. So when people come in, most people will get an IV. The IV changes the the body's whole system and the flow of oxytocin, which is the main hormone that drives the birthing waves. Then they might break the water. That is very common. Sometimes if you break the water, the little cord of the baby was down next to the bottom of where the cervix is and it gets whooshed out with the water. Then you've got a medical emergency on your hands. So that's one intervention that can cause problems because if the cord is coming out, it's being kinked like a hose right at the cervix and we're going to surgery very quickly here. But if that doesn't happen and it doesn't happen much, but it does occasionally, then hold on. 
Okay, sorry. It's all right. Breaking the water can also put more pressure on the baby's head. When more pre because that the bag of waters, there's a four waters. So down where the cervix is, right here, the four waters, this bag of water is like a water balloon, is cushioning the baby's head as it moves down and presses on the cervix. If that is gone, the baby's head presses on the cervix directly, and it can actually affect their blood vessels in their head. And then their, you know, the fetal heart tones change. There are other interventions that once they start the IV, they might want to speed things up because, again, we're trying to save time. And so they'll give Pitocin, which is artificial oxytocin, which stops the flow of natural oxytocin and creates what's called titanic contractions. And that means that they're, they become full and big very quickly stay extremely hard, and then recede. And in doing so, every time at the top of a contraction, the baby's heart rate will go way, way down because it's squeezing the baby's, that place where the baby gets its oxygen from through the cord in the placenta. It's squeezing it off, like kinking it with a hose. And so the baby's heart rate will start to go down and down. There's something called epidural fever that the mom can get because she has an epidural. And the drugs do sometimes get into the baby, even though they tell you that they don't. But the baby is affected by epidurals. And then for many people, because they can't feel the lower half of their body, they can't push the baby out properly. So they have to have the baby pulled out in one way or another. And that could be forceps or vacuum extraction. And we can avoid so much of this. There's even things that can cause you, for instance, if the titanic contractions are too strong, then the fetal heart tones get too bad or too low, then we have to have a cesarean section. So it's a domino effect. You do one thing and it causes another thing and the dominoes keep falling and falling until your birthing is nothing like what we wanted it to be. And so we do teach people to become really excellent consumers, to research what they want ahead of time. And this is good. This is true for anybody who's going to have a baby. Research the kind of birthing that you want ahead of time and the choices that you have and the benefits and risks and alternatives of those things and go in and use your voice and say, I want you to explain to me all about this before you do it. And then I will let you know my decision. And so all of that is really important because management of birth changes it. Whereas in midwifery, we basically watch. A midwife's job is to watch, listen to the baby's heart tones quite often, which they do. Watch the mother, make sure that everything is progressing well and that she's fine. And then hold their hands out. Here's your baby. Watching allows you to be safe and protected and cared for during your birthing and for the birthing to progress physiologically, which is as it should. And in, in what ways, in your view, in your constructive view, does the traditional medical model fall short in addressing the holistic aspects of pregnancy? The whole attitude that pregnancy is a disease in need of a cure, that childbirth is a disease in need of a cure, that's it in a nutshell. They need to stop all that. And that is what they unfortunately learn in medical school. And I think we're getting a little better. I think the new doctors that are coming out are learning more about what real physiological birth is and that pregnancy, it's much better for the patient to reassure them rather than to instill fear seeds. Like the first time you see a, a pregnant person and you say, oh, you had a cesarean last time, then your pelvis isn't big enough. You'll just have to have another one. No. 
it's not necessarily true. We have had many people, I've known many people over the last 33 years that I've been a childbirth educator who were told they had to have a cesarean the first time around because no baby's getting out of that tiny little pelvis. And yet, the next time, the next pregnancy, they hire a midwife who goes, eh, I'll get you in an upright position, you'll be fine. And they give birth to a baby that's a pound larger, somehow through the same pelvis. Mm. So if we plant those seeds early on in a positive way, it would be much more productive and much better for the patient and the patient's baby down the road when the baby is being born. Yeah, that's beautiful. In terms of one's emotional well-being, in what way does traditional norms neglect the emotional well-being of expectant parents during childbirth? How does neglecting emotional well-being potentially lead to increased stress, anxiety, and postpartum challenges? It's interesting in the U.S., and this is not their fault, but an average physician gets about eight minutes, eight to 10 minutes with their patients. They're being absolutely squashed by insurance companies to, so that they have to see more and more patients in order to just have a practice. And so there isn't time to go over how are you doing? What is your emotional state? What's happening at home? Now, on the flip side of that, when you see a midwife, she usually spends about an hour. And part of what she spends, the time she spends with you, is finding out all about you and your lifestyle and your family and your emotional state so that then you can feel cared about and calm. And when the more she knows about your emotional state, the more she can recommend things that can help, like meditation, like visualization, like hypno babies. And then that is going to help you. So you're helping yourself by going to the midwife and then she's helping you stay calm and relaxed and look forward to the birthing and do things. And every time you see her, every month that you see her, and then at the end you see her every two weeks, and then you see her every one week, and then you see her a couple times a week as it gets closer and closer to your guest date, and you feel cared for. And if you have other children, you can bring them to your appointment, or the midwife will come to you. It depends on the midwife. Uh, so it's a completely different experience, and it does set up a completely different emotional response. I love all the reframes that you put into the educational program and I think your journey and the insights that you can offer into therapeutic hypnosis can provide listeners with a wealth of knowledge. And I really do appreciate your time and expertise in shedding light on this transformative power of hypno babies. Do you have any passing words at all? And where can people find you? Oh, parting words for the younger set who are coming up and having babies now is, yes, you do need childbirth education. I am not going to direct you where to get it, but you really need to know what it's all about, how the body works the stages of birthing and what to expect and how to be your own best health advocate. Super, super important. Mm -hmm. And how they can get a hold of me. We have a wonderful website at hypnobabies.com and that's H-Y-P-N-O-B-A-B-I-E-S.com. We have our store, which is hypnobabies-store.com. And that is where you can find our hypnobirthing courses, our breastfeeding course. We have a laid back breastfeeding course, which is fantastic. Preparing for your hospital stay and recovery course, our fertility program, because we love to get people pregnant with hypnosis as well. 
in our hypno doula training program where we train traditionally trained doulas to become hypno doulas and really assist no students. And we have many individual tracks and sets, tracks for VBAC moms and twins moms and oh my gosh, on and on, even weight release, stress and anxiety and study habits and focus and concentration for people who are easily distracted. So jump on our store. And also we have hypnotherapists at Hypno Babies, clinical and certified hypnotherapists, so that if you have anything special that you would like to work on, a fear, a phobia, or maybe you have birth trauma, anything like that, you can email me at director at hypnobabies.com and I will get you hooked up with a wonderful hypnotherapist that can help you with private sessions. Beautiful. And it's been a real honor and a privilege to have you on the show, Kerry. And while you're prom promoting emotional well-being, I think it's also crucial to provide realistic expectations and preparation for potential challenges which HypnoBabies provides. And I looked at your website, and it's very comprehensive. There's a lot on there. So I encourage listeners to hop on there and, and check it out. But I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and giving us your insights and your time and really for talking about the vulnerability of your journey and what led you to this point, because I can see that you are a pioneer of the future and not a prisoner of the past. And when you look at pioneers, you can always see the arrows in their back. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for really asking such wonderful questions. I just love it. I just love how you asked everything. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>